Hello to everyone who is watching this video. This is Ashkan and in this video I will be presenting about ammonia production. Now here's how I have categorized my topic starting with what is ammonia, going with ammonia production uh, industry, a steam A reforming process, overall reaction, desulfurization, primary and secondary uh, reforming, shift conversion, methanation, and finally Haber-Bosch process. Now, what is ammonia? Ammonia is a molecule consisting of nitrogen and hydrogen covalently bounded with an angular, angular bond of 107 degrees with a molecular formula of NH3. These colorless gases contributed significantly to the uh, nutritional and pharmaceutical needs of people around the world. Have you ever asked yourself with 6.92 billion people around the world how does the food production industry is able to feed all of them well the answer lies in the huge role of ammonia on food industry approximately 83 percent of ammonia produced around the world is used as fertilizers either as either in the salt um, form or as solution so Two, there, is, there are currently two main types of ammonia production process in operation around the world. The first one is the steam reforming of natural gas or other light hydrocarbons, for example, natural gas liquids or liquidified petroleum gas. And the other pathway is par partial oxidation of uh, heavy fuel or oil or vacuum residue. About 85% of world ammonia production is based on a steam reforming process. As you can see in this slide, this is Gujarat State Fertilizers and Chemicals uh, Guj uh, located in Gujarat, India. And in this slide, you are seeing Burap Fertilizers plant in Western Australia, which can produce 760,000 tons of liquid ammonia per year. Before starting to go to the actual process of ammonia production, uh, let's refresh our memory on three important principles. First one, the effects of catalysts on rate of reaction. A catalyst speeds up the rate of reaction either by allowing a different reaction mechanism or by providing additional mechanisms. The overall effect is to lower the activation energy, which means the rate of reaction. The second principle, the effect of pressure on the rate of reaction. In order for any reaction to happen, those particles must first collide. This is true where both particles are in the gas state, or whether one is a gas and the other is a solid. If the pressure is high, the chance of having successful collisions are greater. A Chatelier's principle. A Chatelier, the Chatelier's principle states that a dynamic equilibrium tends to respond so as to relieve the effect of any change in the condition that affect the equilibrium. The important con two important concepts of, of this principle apl applied to the ammonia production are the following. First, in an exothermic reaction, decreasing the temperature would resolve the equilibrium to shift toward the product. And the second concept, when there is a fewer gaseous product molecules than reactant gaseous molecule, increasing the pressure would force the equilibrium to shift toward the product. Now that you have refreshed your mind on these three principles, I will start explaining the ammonia production process. Starting with natural gas coming through, the second part is desulfurization, going with primary reformer, secondary reformer, a CO a shift conversion, CO2 removal, methanation, compression, and finally ammonia synthesis. Starting with the overall reaction, in order to produce ammonia, hydrogen gas uh, and nitrogen gas need to be presented. However, because there is not sufficient hydrogen supplies in the air, the hydrogen gas needs to come from another source, which in this case is methane. The overall reaction consists of methane, air, and water as reactants, which would produce carbon monoxide, nitrogen, and hydrogen. The nitrogen and hydrogen is then used to produce ammonia. Since methane gas contains a little bit of sulfur oxide and hydrogen sulfide impurities, this step, which is the step of desulfurization, is, uh, is necessary because these impurities would poison the catalysts that are used further in the next chambers. 
and at the end the zinc sulfide remain in the absorption bed and will be removed from the from methane primary reformer the steam gas mixture is then heated further to 500 uh, to between 500 to 600 degrees celsius after desulfurization but because the reaction is highly endothermic the additional heat is required so the temperature would be raised to a temperature between 780 to 830 degrees celsius at the reformer outlet the reformer consists of iron containing reforming catalyst so this is the first part in which catalysts are coming into action catalyst has no effect on the position of chemical equilibrium rather it provides an alternative pathway uh, with lower activation energy and hence increase the reaction rate they are remaining chemically unchanged at the end of the reaction the first Haber-Bosch reaction chambers use osmium and ruthenium as catalysts however under Bosch's direction in 1909 a much less expensive iron-based catalyst was discovered that is still used today. Part of the industrial production now takes place with a ruthenium rather than an iron catalyst because this more active catalyst allows uh, reduced operating pressures. Moving on to the second reformer. Only 30 to 40 percent of the hydrocarbon react in the primary reformer. So the secondary reformer is needed to have the rest of the unreacted hydrocarbons uh, blended with air uh, for additional yield of hydrogen gas. Now moving on to the shift conversion. In the shift conversion process, the reforming process will produce um, undesired carbon monoxide, which needs to be removed. This is what happened in shift conversion. The gas is passed through a bed of iron oxide, yeah, iron oxide, uh, and chromium oxide catalyst at around 400 degrees Celsius, which is called the high temperature shift conversion or HTS. CO2 removal. The carbon dioxide is then removed by absorption in aqueous ethanolamine solutions. As you can see in the diagram, the carbon dioxide and water are being removed out of the process. Now, the next process is methanation. Still, there is a small amount of carbon uh, monoxide and carbon dioxide remaining in the process, which need to be converted to methane. The reaction takes place at around 300 degrees Celsius uh, in a reactor filled with, an, uh, with iron containing catalyst, as you can see in this diagram. And now, moving on to the final step, which is the Haber Bosch process. To produce the desired end product ammonia, the hydrogen is then catalytically reacted with nitrogen uh, derived from process air to form anhydrous liquid ammonia. This step is known as the ammonia synthesis loop or as we call it the Haber-Bosch process. Now there are two important factors laying in this process. First one is the Le Chatelier's principle for higher yield of ammonia and then the effect of pressure on rate of reaction. The ammonia production reaction is an endothermic reaction, thus heat releases as the reaction proceeds. The Chatelier's principle predicts that the yield of ammonia is greater at lower temperature, this way there is more ammonia produced. However, this would make another huge problem. Low temperature would decrease the rate of reaction, this is crucial when we examine the, uh, the business issues associated with the company producing the ammonia. Now combined with Le Chatelier's principle, the effect of pressure on rate of reaction comes into the action. At high pressure, the rate of reaction will increase according to the collision theory. The, the high pressure would cause more successful collisions, therefore the rate of reaction would be increased. Consequently, the pressure would also affect the equilibrium of the ammonia synthesis reaction. According to Le Chatelier's principle, the yield of ammonia is greater at higher pressure. Higher pressure, uh, high, high pressure, so high pressure will contribute to two important factors. First, it would increase the rate of reaction, which was or originally decreased by the low temperature, and then it would forcing the equilibrium, shifting it toward the products. However, high-pressure plants are expensive to build and maintain, however. 
A German chemical engineer, Karl Busch, solved this problem by designing a double weld steel vessel that could operate at several hundred times of atmospheric pressure. Modern plants operate at pressures in the range of 200 uh, kilopascals to, t uh, to 30 hundred kilopascals. The gas mixture is kept, keep pressurized in a condenser uh, and ammonia is removed from the reaction vessel by cooling the mixture. Because of the hydrogen bonding between ammonia molecules, the gas condenses into a liquid while the nitrogen and hydrogen remain as gases. Nitrogen is removed to shift the equilibrium toward the uh, production of more ammonia. Once the ammonia is removed, the gas are recycled back to the reaction vessel in a con uh, continuous operation. As you can see in this emphasized part of the diagram, this is the part where the unreacted nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas is getting back into the reactor to be uh, processed and reacted again to produce more ammonia. And uh, this was my end, end of my presentation uh, in this video. And here are my references that I have used for the information that I get. I hope you uh, enjoy this video.